title of this study is the beast of revelation okay now the uh interesting thing about that title is that you'll notice that i have there the beast singular of revelation but some of you who will be already familiar with the book of revelation and uh who have read it before we'll know that there are a number of beasts in the book of revelation so the question is why why is it titled the beast of revelation and not the beasts plural of revelation well i'm hoping that i will be able to answer that question uh, and hopefully you will see that both are really true there are a number of beasts in the book of revelation but there is also just one beast in the book of revelation so that's a little bit of a mystery at the beginning of our study together uh, and hopefully um, uh, it will make sense by the end of the study okay so one of the things which you cannot escape when thinking about the book of revelation is that it's right at the very end of our bibles it's the 66th book and that is so important. It might seem a very uh, simple observation and an obvious one, but that's actually a very, very important point because what we're going to see is that the book of Revelation is packed with Old Testament uh, illusion, citation, and uh, imagery more than any other book uh, and I suppose it makes sense because remember that Jesus was called the word made flesh and this is his message to John. And so it's no wonder that it's just full of his father's word. And so it's, we find that it's very, very dense uh, and we can find uh, so many old Testament um, illusions uh, just in simple words and phrases but there are a couple of old testament scriptures which are especially important when it comes to the book of revelation and it probably is no surprise to you that one of the most important books of the old testament in relation to the book of revelation is the book of daniel and in fact i might even say a particular chapter in daniel daniel chapter 7 is very important when it comes to understanding the book of revelation and sometimes i think that the book of revelation tries to tell us this right from the start in fact if you have a look at revelation chapter 1 and if you have just read daniel chapter 7 you suddenly see all these similarities of language all these allusions to daniel chapter 7 um, chapter 1 of revelation and verse 6 talks about to him to jesus be glory and dominion forever and ever and chapter 7 verse 14 talks about the son of man being brought before the ancient of days and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom uh, verse 7 behold he is coming with clouds daniel chapter 7 verse 13 i saw in the night visions behold with the clouds of heaven there came one uh, the son of man is mentioned in revelation 1 verse 13 and in verse 13 of daniel 7 there came one like a son of man and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him uh, the Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1 is described as having the hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, the ancient of days, that's God, Jesus' father, as is depicted as having clothing as white as snow and the hair of his hair like pure wool. So I suppose like father, like son you could say there but the point is that already in revelation chapter one we have so many throwbacks so many links to uh the book of daniel 
and in particular, uh, Daniel chapter 7. And, and the reason that's significant in relation to this study is because we know Daniel as another book of the Bible where we come across beasts. Uh, and we also know Daniel as being uh, the, the book which begins um, the, with this amazing uh, statue, this vision that Nebuchadnezzar the king had of this uh, statue in Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to uh, not go in detail, into detail in relation to Daniel chapter 2, like we have done in the past and like we sometimes do. Uh, but I want to just um, remind you of it. And hopefully uh, this, this makes uh, sense and is familiar to us. Uh, if it's not, it might be something that we can go through again some other time. But you remember that there were four metals, four main metals associated with this image. The head of gold, uh, the shoulders and arms of uh, uh, silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet, part iron and part clay. And we associate those metals, each of them, with different empires that came, four successive empires which came one after another. First of all, Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, then Rome, and then finally, the feet belonged to this period after Rome divided, the Roman Empire divided in around about AD 476. And uh, it's never been able to uh, be united completely and properly again, although many have tried to do this. Now, when we come to Daniel chapter 7, now we have not Nebuchadnezzar having a vision, but Daniel himself. He has a night vision, probably a nightmare, you could say. And in this uh, vision of the night, he also sees the kingdom of man, but he sees it not as uh, an image of wonderful shiny metal, but he sees it as four separate beasts, and they are associated with the same kingdoms. So the first, you remember, was like a lion with eagle's wings. And uh, the Medo-Persian Empire was likened to a second beast, like a bear. Uh, the fourth, or third rather, the third beast was like a leopard, four bird-like wings on its back. And then the Roman Empire is likened to a fourth beast, which it's very hard for Daniel to describe. It just, he says, it was dreadful, terrible, very strong. Two large rows of iron teeth that devoured and crushed and anything that was left of it, it trampled with its feet. So a lion, a bear, a leopard, and something very, very grotesque and violent. So uh, another maybe useful image would be this one here. Because when we get down to this section, we are associating the legs of iron with this fourth beast. But then you might remember that in Daniel chapter 7, this fourth beast changes before Daniel's eyes. Something happens. And he has ten horns that come up on his head. And you could say that that's probably not dissimilar um, to ten toes on the feet. Okay. Um, but then that's not the end of the story. Something happens in relation to the ten horns. Three of them get uprooted by this little horn 
that comes through. And this little horn is quite notable for its character, as we'll see. Um, so let's just have a closer look at that, because what we want to do now is just zoom, zoom in a little bit on this fourth beast. Okay, so let's just, just remind ourselves of Daniel chapter 7. After these things, as I was watching in the night, a fourth beast appeared, one dreadful, terrible, and very strong. It had two large rows of iron teeth. It devoured and crushed, and anything that was left, it trampled with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that came before it. And here it is. Notice this. It had ten horns. There we go. Now, as I was contemplating the horns, Daniel says, he's looking at these horns. Another horn, a small one, came up between them. And three of the former horns were torn out by the roots to make room for it. This horn had eyes resembling human eyes and a mouth speaking arrogant things. So all of a sudden we can see that this vision that Daniel is receiving is giving us more information than the vision of Daniel chapter 2. It was pretty easy to see the similarity to begin with. But now that we're down to the fourth beast, we've got things happening on the head of the fourth beast and its horns and everything, which is not reflected at all in Daniel chapter two and the description of the feet and the toes. So Daniel seven, more information. Now, Daniel is really, really starting to focus on this little horn. In fact, he presses the angel in Daniel chapter 7 for more information about this little horn. It's, it's really quite unique among all these other horns. And without going into um, Daniel 7 in great detail, let me just show you this slide here. And here we've got a list of the characteristics of this little horn. He's described as blasphemous. That's interesting. Blasphemy has to do with God, doesn't it? It's, it's something which is a challenge and it's disrespectful towards God and, and uh, his ways. We find that it's just as violent as the beast upon which it originally came up on. It's militant. It's arrogant. It's very, very focused on persecuting and destroying God's people. So this becomes, this little horn becomes an enemy of God uh, to an even more profound extent than anything that has gone before because it's zeroing in on persecution of God's people. It's not that the other beasts weren't, but there's something particularly foul and terrible about this little horn. And Daniel is able to get a glimpse of this little horn finally being judged and destroyed by Jesus Christ and, it says, the saints of the Most High. All right? So just think about that. We've got this terrible beast and all of a sudden Daniel's watching and he sees these 10 horns arise on the beast. Then he sees this little horn come up in a violent and uh, dramatic way. And the feature of this little horn is it's got a big mouth and it's speaking great things. It's, it's speaking above its pay grade. It's, it's blasphemous and it's violent. Okay, so that's briefly and quickly the history as we have it told of the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. Now I can tell you that even though Daniel was given 
a lot of information. He wanted more. He wanted to know more about the fourth beast and upon the, about the horns and the little horn. Okay, but there was only so much information that the angel was prepared to give him. Now, here's the key, and here's what I want um, us to, to get as really, I suppose, the main point out of this study. Just like Daniel chapter 7 zooms in on the legs of iron and gives us much more information about the fourth beast, the book of Revelation is largely zooming in on the horns and the little horn that are on the head of the fourth beast. Okay, so um, I've put it like this in the slide. See that? The scroll of Revelation is the unfolding history of this part of the image of Daniel chapter 2. You can say that the, the ankles and the feet and the toes is magnified and blown up to be the story that's unfolded over a 2,000 year period in the book of Revelation. So what I'm saying is that the book of Revelation is the story of the fourth beast of Daniel in greater detail. So let me um, illustrate that to you in another way. Okay. There we have the uh, pictures that we're familiar with. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. But if we focus on this fourth beast, we find that Revelation unrolls that out into four new beasts to tell the story of what happens on the head of this one. And it does that because Daniel chapter 7 is not long enough to give us all of that information. And actually, if you think about it, it's not information that was needed for Daniel and his people in those times to have. It was something that could be saved for later. And it was saved until the Lord Jesus Christ arrived in heaven, got all that detail from his father, and then passed it on uh, as the book of Revelation. So in the book of Revelation, we have four main beasts. Now, some of these pictures are a little bit uh, funny uh, and there's a reason for those, a bit cartoony. I can assure you they're much more frightening, much more terrible. Um, but we have a dragon in Revelation 12, a sea beast and an earth beast in Revelation 13, and in Revelation 17, a harlot beast. Call that because it's the beast which is being ridden by now a great prostitute okay so you'll see already probably why it is that i call this study the beast of revelation because what i'm suggesting to you is that a key to understanding the book of revelation is to understand that all of these in a sense are still the fourth beast of daniel chapter 7 okay but we'll find that this beast evolves as it were it goes through these different phases and uh we find that it is able to sort of change its form and its guise a little bit uh depending on the circumstances and the history and the context and the culture that's surrounding it but underneath it's the same system it's the same power all right so what i want to do now is let's just visit quickly a couple of those um, quotes in Revelation which describe those beasts and I want you to see if you can see the connections back to Daniel chapter 7. When you look at the descriptions of these beasts in Revelation it's almost as if Jesus said to his angel I want you to make sure they understand the connection with Daniel. 
put the detail in there, which makes them see the link. They've got to understand this. All right. So first of all, in Revelation 12, we have the red dragon. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads seven diadems. Now, diadem is just a crown. So on his heads, there are seven crowns and you can see the crowns on the heads of this dragon. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here. Uh, first of all, remember back in Daniel chapter 7, we had a lion, a bear, and a leopard. But then the fourth beast was just described as a fourth beast. Daniel wasn't able to say that it looked like any creature at all. Typically. I'm going to suggest that that's because what he was really seeing was more like a dragon. And in Revelation 12, it's identified as a dragon. But what's the connection, the obvious connection with Daniel chapter 7? Well, here it is. It's seven heads and ten horns. That's the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. But now there's something really interesting that Daniel chapter 7 didn't tell us. There were crowns on the heads of the beast. Okay. So that's just something to notice. Now, the next time we read about a beast in Daniel, it's actually in the very next chapter, chapter 13, and it's a beast which comes out of the sea. And that's why it gets called uh, the sea beast. What can we see about the sea beast? I saw a beast rising out of the sea, notice this, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Okay, so <laughs> you can see once again that we've got some very obvious connections back to Daniel chapter 7. But there's something similar to the beast that's gone before and something different. Notice the crowns. Remember, if we just go back, we see that the crowns were on the heads of this beast. All right, it means that the beast itself was the great power, it was ruling. But now we've got the crowns on the horns. So the power is transferred from the beast and it's now on the horns of the beast. All right. Now, the next beast is also in Revelation chapter 13. And it says there that I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. And if we have a look at this particular beast, the earth beast, once again, we see that in Revelation 13, it's noted for its mouth. It speaks like a dragon. It's, it's ferocious, it's blasphemous, and it persecutes God's people. So what I'm going to suggest is that really what we've got here is a beast 
that's unfolding for us the detail and the history of this character here okay the little horn of daniel chapter 7 then when we get to revelation chapter 17 got a very interesting situation once again we're confronted with a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names so there's that idea of blasphemy again seven heads ten horns so again same beast but this time sitting on the scarlet beast is a woman that's been drinking and what is she drinking she's drunk it says with the blood of the saints the blood of the martyrs of jesus and when i saw her i marveled greatly okay so this uh represents the final phase really of this beast and there's this woman who's clearly uh an immoral ungodly woman who's responsible for persecuting god's people as well and she's with the beast and you think where did she come from and how did she end up riding that 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 system that power would you know you only find one other place in revelation where you have this kind of woman and she's not that kind of woman completely yet when we first meet her in the book of revelation she's in chapter two chapter two of revelation we have the church or the ecclesia in thyatira and thyatira is being um warned by the lord that judgment is becoming coming upon them because they tolerate something inside the church and it's the woman jezebel and what is she doing she is committing the same sorts of immorality and she is corrupting the servants of god when we get to revelation 17 this woman is now outside the church as it were and doing what she's doing on a far greater scale deceiving nations but it's interesting to note that as far as revelation is concerned her origin is inside the church inside the ecclesia okay so if we were to put all that together I want to show you this slide and hopefully that makes it um, a little bit more straightforward to understand. The dragon in Revelation 12 is the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, which was still ruling when John received the revelation okay and the roman empire was still uh, in control it was still being ruled by the emperors from rome and rome is the city of seven hills and uh and so you had uh seven heads with the crowns on the heads but in 476 a.d barbarians from the north of the roman empire began storming or not not began they'd begun doing it for a couple of hundred years before that but a major horde of them stormed over the river danube and rome itself was captured and the empire of rome was divided into all these different parts represented by the ten horns and so the Roman Empire was no longer one single empire, but it was now a divided Roman Empire ruled by individual kingdoms. They were the Goths, the Huns, the Visigoths, the Vandals, etc. And it was 
the divided Roman Empire, which gave rise to nation states. Okay, and uh, it's the origin of a France, a Germany, etc. And the fact that uh, it was now divided and Roman Empire now no longer ruled itself completely is indicated, as we mentioned before, by the transfer of the crowns from the heads to the horns. Okay, so we now have a divided Roman Empire full of individual nation states, and I think there were original, originally just 10 of them, uh, and they are now sovereign and ruling themselves. Then, what's interesting is along came the earth beast or the little horn. And there were three particular nation states ruling in uh, a significant part of Europe, which were overtaken by a new power that came on the scene. A power which was still linked to this beast because it was centered in Rome. And the earth beast becomes uh, the detail of the little horn, which stands for the Roman papacy Roman Catholic Church, which became effectively a nation state itself, uh, controlling the whole of Europe uh, for many, many centuries. So the beasts of Revelation 12 and 13 are the unfolding of the detail of the beast of Daniel chapter 7. All right. Now, Revelation chapter 17, the beast which is um, controlled by the harlot, uh, is the final phase of the beast of Rome, as it were. And it's the phase that of the beast that's going to be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and those who are with him. Okay, so this power is not done yet. It's not over. We still have a divided uh, Europe. Okay, we still have individual nation states. We have them uh, for many years uh, ca calling themselves a federated uh, united group. Okay, so it's the beast as it were, once again. Uh, and we still have the, uh, the Roman uh, papacy, the Catholic Church, centered in Rome, uh, having huge influence on political affairs in that region. Sometimes it's not so obvious to us uh, how involved and how influential the Catholic Church is, uh, but sure enough, she's there and uh, very, very uh, influential behind the scenes. But in every single phase, and this is the important part, in every single phase, every single iteration of its existence, be it the dragon, pagan Rome, be it uh, in the period of the, um, the nation states of Europe prior to the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, and then during the period of the Holy Roman Empire, in every single phase, this power particularly was antagonistic towards the saints and the people of God. They persecuted uh, God's children. All right? And that is why it is the point of such a focus in um, the book of Revelation. Okay. So let me uh, just remind you then of this vision and again uh, these principles relating to this king priest and and probably now it becomes even more obvious 
why he has the this disposition towards uh, the world at the outset of Revelation chapter 1 because there is a very clear enemy that is going to be present through the greater part of that 2000 year period that's about to unfold it's the ancient enemy of Daniel chapter 7 it's the Roman Empire and all the different phases and stages that it's going to go through it's going to be antagonistic towards the people of God and so Jesus is going to confront it at various points throughout the book of Revelation but he's going to do so in such a way as to be able to continue to uh, encourage and protect and guide his people as the as their high priest whilst at the same time confronting the beast and its followers now uh, let me just show you this one again as well and we've got the the seals the trumpets and the vials and as i said before they relate to three main stages of uh the history of man as it's it's going to be un, unveiled during this period and they also relate to uh these periods of the fourth beast of daniel so this period here the seals happen mostly in the period of the dragon the red dragon of daniel oh sorry revelation chapter 12. okay so this is pagan rome and the seals relate the catastrophes and the problems that came upon pagan rome in response to their persecution of the christians and at the end of this period pagan rome was broken up and overcome by a man called constantine who professed to be a christian all right and that's the point at which the dragon of revelation 12 transforms into the sea beast of revelation chapter 13 and the sea beast and the earth beast are ruling during this period right up until the uh, second earthquake where you've got the uh, the earth beast really uh, being destroyed as it were uh, and enters a new phase uh, for the last period the vials all right so and we'll probably see this in a little bit more detail in in the studies that come but uh all of these uh stages have um, an impact on the way the fourth beast uh, morphs and changes because of the changes uh, that are brought upon it now the seals the trumpets and the vials if you read them in the book of revelation you will see that they come across as being judgments judgments upon uh, this system and this power these beasts but i want um, us to understand why it is that judgments come upon them it's not that jesus is just being punitive it's not that he is just dealing out punishment for punishment's sake all right have a look at revelation chapter 9 this is one of the few times i'm going to get you to actually turn up this passage and revelation chapter 9 is the chapter in which the fifth trumpet is first of all blown in verse 1 of revelation chapter 9 the fifth angel blew his trumpet 
Then in verse uh, 13, the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And, and, and as a result of these trumpets being blown, catastrophic things are coming upon the earth. Why, though? Why are they coming upon the earth? If there is a power that is religious, claiming to be religious, persecuting God's people, why is it suffering? What's that about? Well, verse 20 and verse 21 provide the answer. Look at this. It says there, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, because that's what they are, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons, idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So that's a really important point, because what I want us to realise from this is that all the while where you've got this enemy of God's people, which is persecuting them, God is reaching out, as it were, to them, engaging with them, bringing upon them judgments and events which are calculated to induce them to repent. God wants them to be his people. He wants them to leave the side of the dragon and come to the side of the lamb. But it means repentance. It means changing their ways. Okay, have a look at Revelation chapter 16 and we'll see the same thing. Revelation chapter 16 is where the bowls are being poured out. Okay, and again, these things are, are catastrophic. They're, they're harmful. Uh, they're judgments. And why are they being brought out? Look at it says in verse 6, um, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. So this is judgment for their violence and their persecution. But why is this coming on them? To what end? To what purpose? Look at verse nine they were scorched by the fierce heat and they cursed the name of god who had power over these plagues they did not repent and give him glory uh, verse 11 they cursed the god of heaven for their pain and sores they did not repent of their deeds and maybe maybe some of them uh did but uh, on the whole it's saying that there was not an attitude of repentance. But the point is that that's what God wants to elicit from them. That's what he was trying to achieve, uh, their repentance. Okay, so uh, let's just have a look at this as well. Uh, and this might also uh, be found to be helpful just as an overview. Okay, the seals, which we're going to look at in more detail uh, in on Saturday. It relates to the gradual weakening and the fall of pagan Rome. Okay, so that's when the fourth beast uh, finally lost its power. Now, here's another interesting thought. Remember back to Daniel chapter 2, how does the iron lose its power? The legs are of iron, and as it come down, as you come down to the feet and toes, you find that it's now mixed with clay. So the iron is weakened because it's now a mixture of clay and iron. How did that happen? Well, after, as pagan Rome was falling, a lot of the weakening of the Roman Empire was occurring because barbarians were invading the empire 
infiltrating the iron, bringing in new blood, as it were, and carving off sections of the empire for themselves. The clay was mixing with the iron, and that's what caused the ten horns to emerge and these individual nation states to pop up on what once was the United Roman Empire. And it was after that, that the little horn popped up in Rome, the papacy, and controlled all of those nation states. But the trumpets, one after the other, is the successive invasions of the Roman Empire by the barbarian hordes, which is what caused the destruction ultimately of pagan Rome and the change of the beast. The bowls of wrath, which we will look at on Sunday, uh, is the judgment of the little horn. It prophesies the return of the Jews in 1948, and it ends with the stone striking and destroying the image. So back in Daniel chapter two. All right. So again, hopefully what you can see there is that Daniel two is expanded on by Daniel chapter seven and Daniel seven is expanded on by the revelation seals, the trumpets and the vials and these um, four beasts. But ultimately, if you want to summarize the whole thing, you can go all the way back to Daniel chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 16 is this happening in a nutshell and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the destruction of the kingdom of man. Well, what happens after the destruction of the feet and toes and the, of part iron and part clay and the rest of the metals. In Daniel chapter 2, you remember the stone grows and expands and gradually fills the whole earth until you have the kingdom of God uh, as the only power ruling the nations. And so from Revelation chapter 20, 21 and 22, we have uh, essentially the, the detail again of that little stone growing and filling the earth. The kingdom is given to the saints. The mountain grows to fill the earth. And we end up in Revelation chapter 22 with a curse removed and global obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So